Now, um, what I'm going to preach about today is, is mainly found in that last verse of this chapter. It says, Reprobate silver shall men call them, because the Lord hath rejected them. And this is not a fun topic to preach. This is not something that, that I enjoy doing. Um, similar to this morning's one, I mean, it's not, it's not fun coming up and just like, you know, pointing people out and just talking about the, the false prophets and stuff like that. But it's necessary. It's needful. It's something that we need to be aware of and we need to know. And this idea of a reprobate is something that has kind of been lost in, in many churches over time, it seems. But um, it's an important, it's an important concept to understand. This is the first time that this word reprobate is used. And oftentimes in the Bible, if, you want, if there's a word you don't quite understand, very oftentimes you can go and look for the first time that it's used, and usually God will provide a definition for the word within the context the first time that it's used. Just a little tip to kind of use to help you maybe understand some things. Obviously, you can look up all the references and, and get an idea and say, well, what does this word really mean? Um, but here we see it says, reprobate silver shall men call them. Why are they called reprobate silver? Because the Lord hath rejected them. Okay, there are people in this earth that the Bible says that God has rejected. And again, it's not a fun topic, but it's, it's the truth. And these are people, you know, God has rejected them. You know, a lot of people will say, everybody has a chance. Everybody can get saved all the way up until the day you die. That's simply not true. It's not true. There are people that have been rejected of God and where there is no remedy for their situation at all. In Proverbs 6, you don't have to turn to Proverbs 6, 12 says, A naughty person, a wicked man, walketh with a froward mouth. He winketh with his eyes. He speaketh with his feet. He teacheth with his fingers. Frowardness is in his heart. He deviseth mischief continually. He soweth discord. Therefore shall his calamity come suddenly. Suddenly shall he be broken without remedy. Being broken without remedy, I mean, there is no fix for it. Mm -hmm. you, could, you, can, you can try, I and mean, you might think there is, but it's just like, nope, there is, there's no more cure. There's no more remedy. I mean, just like incurable diseases today. I mean, you get certain diseases, you get AIDS, there's no, there's no cure for them. That's just something that's, you know, and, and aid is a big one. I mean, that's a recompense that you get for doing stuff that you really shouldn't be doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, whether it's, I mean, it's, it's by and large, it's homosexuality, but there are a few, other, you know, um, intravenous drug use, stuff like that. But like, that's something you receive that there's no remedy for that. There's no cure for that. That's something you're with for the rest of your life. In uh, Proverbs 29 verse one, it says, he that being often reproved, Hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed in that without remedy. So this is what happens. And, and this kind of illustrates a little bit the people who become reprobate. These, these people that, that there's no remedy for them. Because you see here in Proverbs 29, 1, it says, He that being often reproved. That's someone who's often being told, hey, look, you're wrong. You know, you're not believing right or whatever. You know, from God's word, says this, says this, says this. And they, they start to harden their neck. And they're just, they just get stiff-necked. Over and over, the Bible says, you'll see, people are stiff-necked. They don't want to hear God's word. They don't want to have anything to do with it. And usually it starts off slow, and they just reject it, and reject it, they don't want anything to do with it. But they'll hear it over and over and over again. And it's because, usually, I mean, people love them. They're just trying to say, hey, look, man, the Bible says this. You know, people, we go out and do the same thing. I mean, you want people to get saved. You're going to show them. Your family, your friends, you're going to try to just keep bringing it up. Say, look, man, look, the Bible says this, the Bible says this. But I'll tell you, I'm here to tell you tonight, that there can be a point where people can reject God and harden their necks and just they get to a point where there is beyond, there is no remedy for them. Mm -hmm. They can't get saved. Now, now, think with me here because it might sound like a, like a, a shock. It might sound like, like something you've never heard before. But if you really think about it, we all know for sure, okay, once a person dies... There is no hope for their soul to be saved and go to heaven if they have not already put their faith in Christ, right? I mean, you have to, you have to put your faith in Christ in order to be saved. If you make it to the day of your death and, and you die, if you've not put your faith in Christ, there is no more hope for you. Your soul is going to go to hell and you're going to spend an eternity in hell. We also know that we don't all share that same day. I mean, we don't all live an exact number of days on this earth. Some people live till they're 20, some people live till they're 100. I mean, there's and everything in between, and even, you know, whatever. So there's, there's, there's a whole huge span of how long we live. 
And I mean, right off the bat, right there, you can say, well, that's not fair. Right? I mean, they got to live till they were 70. They only lived till they were 20. All the more reason to preach the gospel, people, because you never know what's gonna, what a day is going to bring. But there are people, when you breathe your last breath, you have no more, no more chances to get saved. And all I'm saying is that that opportunity to get saved does not necessarily have to be at whatever point you breathe your last breath. It can actually happen a little bit before that or a lot before that, depending on what you do. Now, the Bible gives many examples of things that you can do where you can no longer be saved. Number one, go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 3, if you would. Mark chapter number 3 in the New Testament. I want to prove this to you. Again, this is not pleasant. It's not fun. But we need to understand that this is the truth. Um, because, yeah, I mean, it's because the Bible says that. I mean, it's, it's, it's true. Look at um, Mark chapter 3, verse 22, 22. We're going to read about blaspheming the Holy Ghost. The Bible says it's an unforgivable sin. Look at verse number 22 of Mark chapter 3. The Bible reads, And the scribes which came down from Jerusalem said, He hath Beelzebub. This is talking about Jesus Christ. And by the prince of the devils cast thee out devils. So they're saying, look, the only reason why Jesus is able to cast out devils is because he's working for the devil. Like, like he has control over the devils because he is, he is the devil. He's working for the devil. And then verse 23 says, And he called them unto him and said that unto them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? And if a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan rise up against himself and be divided, he cannot stand but hath an end. No man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he will first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. Verily I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men. And blasphemies, wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. And then he explains why he even said that. It says, because they said, he hath an unclean spirit. So we see right here that blaspheming the Holy Ghost he says, you have no forgiveness. You have never forgiveness. Now, Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. But he says that here, if you blaspheme the Holy Ghost, you never have forgiveness. He says, it's not going to be forgiven unto you. You're in danger of eternal damnation. This is one instance where that's the case. I mean, if someone were to blaspheme the Holy Ghost like that, they can no longer get saved. Their opportunity to believe on Jesus Christ is now taken away from them. Um, but now, this is something that I don't know for sure if anyone can, can, can commit that sin today because this is when Jesus Christ was on the earth and they were saying that Jesus Christ was basically of the devil. When he, you know, I mean, he had the miracles, he was casting out devils, and they were just saying, yeah, that's of the devil, which is pretty weird. I mean, that's pretty wicked. Um, I don't know if someone can do that particular sin today or not. Um, I'm not, I'm not really solid on whether or not for sure someone could commit that particular sin, but it doesn't matter because the point's still there of people not being able to be saved where it's just, there's an unforgivable sin, there's an unpardonable sin. Two, look at the end of Revelation, look at the end of the Bible, Revelation chapter 22, another thing that people can do to secure their fate of not being saved prior to death. Revelation chapter 22, the last chapter of the Bible. Look at verse number 18. The Bible says, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take, take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. So he says, look, this is God's word. If you tamper with it, if you, if you add to it, if you remove from it, he's saying, I'm going to add the plagues unto you and I'm going to take your place out of the book of life. And the Bible is clear in, in um, Revelation 20, 15 says, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. If your spot is not in that book of life, you're going to hell and you're going to be there forever. And this is something that people do, not after they die, before they die, they tamper with God's word. The people that are putting out these false perversions of God's word where they're missing entire verses and entire sections and phrases and they're adding stuff in, those people
I mean, it's scary, but those people have sealed their fate. Yes. That is, that is a very, very serious sin. And God says, look, you can't be saved if you do that. That is something I will not, I will not allow. The third thing that people can do that we see in the Bible here is take the mark of the beast. Now, this hasn't happened yet. But in the end times, the Bible, the Bible talks about the Antichrist coming and that you're going to, in order to buy or sell, you're going to have to take the mark of the beast. Look at Revelation. You're in Revelation already. Just flip back to chapter 14. Chapter 14. Look at verse number 9. The Bible says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Again, there's another thing that people can do to secure their fate and make sure they're never going to get saved if you take the mark of the beast. Now, a lot of people will hear these things and say, well, what if a Christian does that? I mean, you know, we preach that, hey, once you're saved, you're saved forever. It's an everlasting life. It's eternal life. What if a Christian were to do that? What if a Christian were to take the mark of the beast? It's impossible. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing, okay? A lot of people say, oh, well, that's just a cop out. What do you mean they can't do it? I mean, any, any Christian can sin. And yes, we're sinners. But Matthew 24 explains and, and clearly states that it is not possible. Matthew 24, I didn't have this in my notes, but... Um, Bear with me here for just a minute. There it is. Verse 24. Matthew 24, 24. It says, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. So he's saying, you know, in the end times, there's going to be false Christs, false prophets that are going to be, they're going to be so convincing and they're going to be doing so many just you know, miraculous things and, and, and all this stuff's going to be happening that if it were possible, they could deceive the very elect. Elect are people who are believers, people who are saved through Jesus Christ. It, meaning that it's impossible to be, it's, it's going to be impossible during this time for a believer to be deceived by that. It's, it's totally impossible. And I also believe that it's impossible for a believer to change the word of God. I mean, I believe if, if for whatever reason you were going to do something like that, God could easily just take you out of this life mm -hmm. and, just, and, just, and just take your life and then you're just dead. I, I don't, I mean, because here's the thing. God's word cannot be contradictory. There's no way. I mean, although if it does, it's not God's word. There's going to be no reason to believe it. And he makes some very clear statements like, one, hey, you have eternal life. It's everlasting life. It's going to last forever. It's a promise. It's true. And then these other things, you know, hey, God's going to, take your name out of the book of life or he's going to, you know, um, you know, if you take the mark of the beast, it says you're, you're going to hell. So, and, and, and we see a clear example here in Matthew 24 that there are some things that's just not possible for a Christian to do that someone would never, I mean, if you're saved, you it just, you would never do it. And, um, like you're never going to be deceived from these false Christ in the end times and you're not going to take the mark of the beast. And, um, you know, I might not understand all the reasons why, but but you know it's true, and, and uh, because it, it has to. I mean, it has to be true. Otherwise, there's a contradiction. And these three things are three examples that of how people can lose their opportunity to be saved prior to dying. And these are all things that people do before they get saved. So they're never saved to begin with, but then they seal their fate by doing one of these things. Now, a lot of people say, well, what if they do those things? But then they believe on Christ. Right? Because all you have to do to be saved is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's a good question. That's a good, you know, it's a good, hey, someone tampered with the Bible, but then later, you know, they, they understood that what they did was wrong and they, and they put their faith on Christ. Well, here's the thing. 
they, they can't believe on Christ after they do those things. And, and we're gonna, I'm going to show you from Scripture people that, um, that tried to, or they pushed it too far, where they crossed the line with God and they became reprobate, either by doing one of these sins or doing something else. And I'm going to get into that a little bit, uh, in a little bit. But God actually makes it impossible for people to believe. And there's many examples of this in the Bible where God will harden their heart. Um, one example is Pharaoh in the book of Exodus. If you remember when Moses was, was leading the children of Israel out of Egypt, he kept on pleading with Pharaoh, like, look, let us go. We're going to do some sacrifices to God. We're going to go do this. And Pharaoh's just like, no, you're not going to do it. So all the plagues started. Moses was just like, and they would happen. And they did them one at a time. And they say, okay, well, you know, God brings the locusts and they destroy all their crops. He turns the, the water into blood and all the fish die and they can't drink the water. And you know, he's doing all these miraculous things. And, that's, and it gets to the point where it's just like, the Pharaoh, like, what are you thinking? You know, like, like all of this stuff is happening. Just let them go. Like, let them do their thing. But the reason why he wouldn't eventually is because God hardened his heart. Now, Pharaoh started out hardening his own heart. He started out, you know, getting his neck stiff before, before he would listen to, you know, and, and just and chose for himself. See, Pharaoh had opportunities to get saved way early on. And he had chance after chance after chance. But see, it got to the point where then God just said, I'm going to harden your heart. You're going to harden your heart against me? Well, guess what? Your heart's hardened now. And in Exodus 11, verse 9, the Bible says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Pharaoh shall not hearken unto you, that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. And Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh, and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, so that he would not let the children of Israel go out of his land. There's an example of God just, just taking away even the ability for Pharaoh to let them go. Even to just, to just say, well, Pharaoh would just be like, yeah, okay, fine, go. God hardened his heart and made it impossible for him to do that. Sion, king of Ashbon, is another example. Deuteronomy 2.24, you don't have to turn there. says, rise ye up, take your journey, and pass over the river Arnon. Behold, I have given into thine hand Sihon the Amorite, king of Heshbon, and his land. Begin to possess it and contend with him in battle. So this is, again, this is Moses going through the wilderness and... Um, they were, you know, going through, they are going to go to the promised land, and he said, look, I'm going to give you the king of Heshbon. And it says um, in verse 25, This day will I begin to put the dread of thee and the fear of thee upon the nations that are under the whole heaven, who shall hear report of thee and shall tremble and be in anguish because of thee. And I sent messengers out of the wilderness of Kedemoth unto Sion, king of Heshbon, with words of peace, saying, so here's the thing, God said, him, look, you're going to go to war with the king of Eshbon, and I'm going to give you their land, and you're going to destroy them, and that's going to be yours. So they go, okay. They send words of peace to King to, to Sion, king of Eshbon, saying, Let me pass through thy land. I will go along by the highway. I will neither turn to the right hand nor to the left. Thou shalt sell me meat for money that I may eat, and give me water for money that I may drink. Only I will pass through on my feet. So he said, look, we just want to pass through. Like, we're just, we're just going from here to there. Like, we need to just pass through your land. Can we please pass through your land? You know, it's not going to cost you anything. We'll pay you. You know, any food that we need, we'll pay you for it. We're going to walk through. We want to get through. And then he says in uh, verse 29, As the children of Esau, which dwell in Seir, and the Moabites, which dwell in Ar, did unto me, until I shall pass over Jordan unto the land which the Lord our God giveth us. But Sion, king of Heshbon, would not let us pass by him, for the Lord thy God hardened his spirit and made his heart obstinate. Obstinate is just like a rock, just like, just no way, I'm not going to let you do that. That he might deliver him into thy hand as appeareth this day. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have begun to give Sion his land before thee, begin to possess that thou mayest inherit his land. So they come with peace. And they're just saying, look, we just want to pass through. But God hardens this guy's heart and says, no, like, like he's not going to let you go. Because God is making it happen. God is making that guy just not even have that ability to, to, to let them pass through peacefully. In, um, in the book of John, you know, there's people that saw the miracles of Jesus Christ and they still didn't believe. Right? I mean, these people witnessed, similarly to Pharaoh, right? Pharaoh was able to witness all these miracles and he still hardened his heart. Well, it was the same thing in, in the days of Jesus Christ. There were a lot of people that saw the miracle that Jesus Christ did. And I, I still think to this day, like, how cool it would have been to be in the days of Jesus Christ and just to see him doing this stuff. 
I mean, like, it's, it's amazing that he didn't have more followers. Like, it's just, just incredible to see what was he doing. Like, I mean, he's just healing people who are sick and just doing all this great work. I mean, just helping so many people out is, is completely amazing. Yet people, they saw it, and they still didn't want to believe. And here's the thing. I mean, God gives you, he'll give you chance after chance. God is long-suffering. I mean, I think about my own sins and the things that I've done in this life. God is extremely long-suffering. And, and over and over again, the book of Psalms, in many places, you know, God is exalted and praised for his long suffering and his mercy and, and, and just, I mean, how loving he is. But at the same time, I mean, there is a point where it's like, look, you have had every opportunity, every chance possible, yet you still harden your heart and God will just turn it and say, okay, I'm going to do the hardening now. You have, you have rejected me for the last time. And God, and God gets sick of it. He's just done with it. In John 12, verse 37, the Bible reads, But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him, that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Go ahead and turn to Isaiah chapter 6 while I'm reading this for you. Isaiah chapter 6, because this is where he's quoting from. Right? Right after he says, But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him, that the saying of his eyes the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah said again, He hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted and I should heal them. The Bible says clearly in John 12, 39, they could not believe. God made it so that they could not believe. And that's why, you know, people say, well, what if you were to do one of these sins and then, and then believe on Christ? It's not possible. If you do one of those things, you know, take the mark of the beast, God's going to make it so you can't believe. Because his word has to be sure. Because the moment you believe on Jesus Christ, hey, you have to be saved. You, you receive everlasting life. There is no qualifications on that. But God can make it so that certain people just can't believe on him. Now, let me be clear, because I'm not a Calvinist. I do not believe that God is just sitting up in, in heaven and just picking and choosing randomly or just at his own will, just this person's going to be saved, this person's going to be damned, and just sealing their fate without anything that they do on their own. No, this happens after people reject him first. And we're going to see that when we get to Romans. We're not in Romans yet. You're in Isaiah chapter 6. Look at, this is the prophecy that's fulfilled in John 12. Isaiah 6, look at verse number 9. And he said, go and tell his people, hear ye indeed, but understand not. And see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat and make their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. This was the prophecy that came true in John in John chapter 12. This is also referred to in Acts 28. If you would flip to Acts 28, right at the end of the book of Acts, because Acts 28 also quotes Isaiah chapter 6, chapter 6 verses 9 and 10, just as John 12 did. This is a concept that's talked about in more than it's more than just Romans 1 that talks about this. There's many places that discuss how people can, can just be hardened and, and get to the point where they become reprobate, or where they become rejected by God. Acts chapter 28, look at verse number 24. It says, And some believed the things which were spoken, and some believed not. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed. After that, Paul had spoken one word. Well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah, which is Isaiah, the prophet, unto our fathers, saying, Go unto this people, and say, Hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and not perceive. For the heart of this people is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed. Lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles and that they will hear it. So basically he's saying, you know, this is, this is the end of the book of Acts. 
And, you know, this is a point where the Apostle Paul was, he was arrested and he appealed unto Caesar. So they send him over to Rome and he gets to Rome and he, you know, he, he brings all the Jews together that were at Rome to, to kind of plead his case and just say, look, this is what happened and just tell him everything that happened. And it says, that's where we kind of catch up here. It says, well, some of the people believed and some people believed not. And basically, he kind of gets fed up and he just says, look, this is what Isaiah was talking about. The heart of this people is waxed gross. He said, their hearts are waxed gross. Their ears are dull of hearing. They don't want to hear about it anymore. They're dull. They just, I, I don't want to hear it. Their eyes have they closed. It's like, I don't want to see it. I don't want to hear about it. I want to have nothing to do with that. It says, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and, and understand with their heart and should be converted, I should heal them. It says, be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles. Now they'll hear it too. He said, look, I'm done with you. The salvation of God is now going to the Gentiles. You, you guys, you, we're done. And the thing is, when people reject God over and 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 over again, God will end up rejecting them. Yeah. And that's just the truth. Turn to Romans chapter 1. If you're in Acts 28, Romans 1 is, the, is, right, is right there. Romans chapter number 1. Again, I mean, this is not a fun sermon. I don't, you know, it's, it's not fun to preach about this, but it's the truth. And, and there are people who the Bible says are reprobate. This is the next mention of reprobate that we're going to turn to. It's in Romans chapter number 1. And we're going to start reading in verse number 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that... Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So this is saying, first of all, I'll say, look, nobody has an excuse to know about God. He's saying, he says, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. The things, God's creation, what God did, it's clear that God exists. It's just being understood by the things that are made. Even as God's eternal power and the Godhead, right? The Trinity, Jesus Christ, God the Father, and the Holy Ghost says, <coughs> these are clearly seen so that they are without excuse. I mean, these people are without excuse. You have no excuse not to put your faith in God and not to trust in God. And then he says, because that when they knew God, so here, these people knew God. It's not saying they never knew him. It's not saying they didn't know anything about God. It's saying when they did know God, because not everybody necessarily knows God, right? I mean, there comes a point where you do hear about God, you learn about God, and he's saying you're without excuse because you, you, you know, everybody learns about God. But he says, but when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. They're the ones darkening heart. They, they become vain. They, in their own imagination, they dream up their own things, their own gods, whatever they want. They're, they're not giving glory unto God. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And you see this is with the atheists all the time. They profess themselves to be wise. They think, we are so smart. Man, those Christians are so dumb because they believe in a cut and fairy tales and the Bible and all this stuff. And they think, they, you know, they puff themselves up and they pride themselves. We are so smart. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Now look at this. Wherefore, that means because of this, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So this is talking about a few different things. He's talking about people who, and a lot of times the Old Testament you see is people who build idols. And it's oftentimes they build these animals, that, you know, the golden calf and all these other things. People just say, like, this is God. Like, just we, we made this, we put this in the fire, this came out, that's God. And that's who they worship. And it's the most ridiculous thing that you could think of that there's just a stump, some piece of wood or some piece of metal, like this is God. Like, like you just made that and formed that and you're calling that a God. But that's what happened when people start doing that and they serve the creature, which is like the creation, more than the creator. 
Do you know there's worshiping things that God actually made instead of God himself? Look at verse 26. It says, For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving themselves that recompense of their error which was meat. And this is the last time it says, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. And then he gives this whole list of, of attributes of these reprobates. God gave these people over. And see, here's the thing. A lot of people get this confused. They'll say, oh, so you believe if someone commits homosexuality, they can't be saved. No, that's not what I believe. I believe that they already became reprobate before they ever did anything, you know, homosexual in nature. They already sealed their fate because God gave them over to do those things which are not convenient. To, to, to be burned in their lust one toward another. That's something that happened after they've already been given up by God. That happens after the fact. The first thing that happens is they reject God. The first thing is they don't want to retain God in their knowledge. They don't glorify the Creator. They worship and serve the creature more than the Creator. These are the things that they do. They don't want to have anything to do with God. They reject God. And then he gives them over to that reprobate mind. And then he says, okay, you're rejected. And here's the thing. Basically, you know, twice it says the natural use. Things that are natural. And by nature, us as human beings, we have natural tendencies. A lot of times we have a natural tendency to sin. You have a natural tendency to tell a lie. You have a natural tendency to steal if you don't have something. There's something that you want. Those are natural things to do. But being burned in a lust towards an, another person of the same gender is not natural. See, the thing is, God gives us consciences. God gives us some kind of restraints in our lives. Normal people, they're like, like, there's certain things you just, you just won't do. Unless God removes that restraint and just says, okay, now you're just like an animal. Now you're just like a beast. And I was talking to someone who tried telling me, like, oh, well, they're bringing up these examples of animals. Well, animals do this, you know, like, in nature. So how can you say it's against nature? It's like, they're an animal. Are you an animal or are you a human being? You know, animals do a lot of things that we don't do. Our, my dogs do a lot of things. They eat feces. They eat dung. Okay, that's not something that I'm going to be doing. Yeah. Maybe that is natural for them, but it's not natural for us. Mm -hmm. It's not natural for a human being to do those things. And the thing is, just because you can find some animal that does it, doesn't make it natural for human beings mm -hmm. to have that type of relationship. And the thing is, God has given them up. We see three times. He's given them up. He's given up. He's given them over to do those things. <clears throat> this is something that happens because they did not want to retain God in their knowledge. They pushed it too far. They've, they've gotten rejected with God. And that's what I'm saying. The, the homosexuality, that's a symptom of their problem. That's a symptom to showing, you know, they've already rejected God. And God's rejected them. Then they did that. It's not because they did something. I'm not, I'm not adding homosexuality as another unforgivable sin. I'm not saying that because that's, that's not what the Bible says. But the Bible just says they're doing that because they've already been rejected. Mm -hmm. They were rejected before that ever even happened. And some people can be rejected and they don't even end up doing the, the homosexuality, but they've already rejected God and God's rejected them. And you see the attributes of these people too. Now, again, look, look, at, this, look at this list in verse 29. It says, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. They have pleasure in their sin. They, I mean, it is not a big deal for them. They, they're proud of their sin. I mean, that's why you see like these, these gay pride parades and stuff. They're filthy in their wickedness and they glory in their shame. They glory in this stuff and just, and just make a big mockery out of it and just think, oh, ha, ha, this is, you know, this is what we do and they're proud of it. They have no 
conscience whatsoever for sin. None. They're just, they're completely just depraved and just reprobate and given up on. And that's, they're just like an animal. And that's what the Bible is describing here. And notice in, in this list, there's a lot of things that are very similar to what we had already read this morning about the false prophets. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is because those false prophets are also reprobate. The covetousness. Remember, the eyes that cannot cease from sin. I mean, there's just no restraint there. There's, there's full of adultery. Full, their eyes can't cease from sin. There's full of covetousness. The false prophets fall into this category of being reprobate and rejected by God. I mean, it, it only makes sense because they know about God. I mean, if you're up there saying, you know, you're preaching the Bible and, and trying to say that this is the truth and you're a false prophet, they know, they know about God. They've heard about it. They've rejected it, though. And they, they, in their, the imagination of their heart, they came up with, with their own religion, their own God. Now, um, turn to 2 Timothy, if you would, chapter 3. This is one more mention of, of, of the word reprobate. 2 Timothy. We're, gonna, we're going to all the references. We're going to every time that word reprobate is used four times in the Bible. We saw the first one in Jeremiah where it gave us that definition. And even in that chapter, if you go back and read that chapter again, you know, it, all the things it's talking about, the people were rejecting God. They didn't want to have anything to do with them. They were rejecting his laws. And you see the same exact things talked about over and over again. But we're going to hit all four because I want you to just understand this concept of a reprobate and understand what it means and just see the scripture behind it. Because, I mean, you have to see it from the Bible. This is something that you can't just accept, just like, oh, yeah, that sounds right, and just, and just believe it. I mean, you've got to see what, what the Bible says about this stuff. Um, because a lot of people, I mean, it's not, it's not necessarily a common teaching these days um, where people even understand what a reprobate is. But we need, to, we need to know these things. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting in verse number 1. The Bible reads, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, and holy, sound familiar? I mean, it sounds exactly like the list we were just reading off in Romans chapter 1, verse 3. Without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. I mean, these people hate people that do good. And not just that, I mean, they're fierce, they're incontinent. I mean, this is people that they don't, they're not, you know, when you talk about tolerance, right? Isn't it, isn't it funny how the, the homosexual community, the, the queer community will say like, you need to be more tolerant of me. Yet, if you're, if you're a Bible-believing Christian, tolerance is the last thing that they are. Yeah, yeah. They, 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 they will have nothing to do with you. And they'll go out, I mean, they'll attack you. They, you know, like Pastor Anderson's business basically got shut down because they were going around just trying to destroy him behind the scenes, just calling up and just, just lying about him and doing all kinds of stuff. Um, I mean, they're, they're fierce. They, don't, they, they hate God they, and they hate people that do good. In uh, verse number four, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power of it. And that, that's pretty interesting because a lot of these people, they have a form of godliness. They have some kind of religion, right? But they deny the power thereof. It says, from such, turn away. Turn away from the reprobate. have nothing to do with them. They shouldn't be your friends. They shouldn't be the people you hang out with have nothing to do with them. It says, For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Again, another verse just stating that, you know, these reprobates can never just put their faith on Christ because they're ever learning. They're, I mean, they could be trying to read the Bible over and over and over and over and over and over again, but the Bible says they're never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. They, just, they can't do it. And then it says in verse 8, Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. They're rejected concerning the faith. They resist the truth. They have nothing to do with the truth. They have corrupt minds. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men as theirs also was. And the last type of person that we're going to see that is a reprobate, again, is the false prophet. Look at Titus chapter number 1, which is just like one page over here in 2 Timothy. Titus is the next book. Titus chapter number 1. 
This is the, the last reference, last scriptural reference that actually uses the word reprobate is in Titus chapter 1. And we're going to start reading verse number 10. The Bible says, For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. Again, this is tying in with what we already heard this morning about the false prophets. The Bible saying their mouths need to be stopped because they subvert whole houses. I mean, whole groups of people are being deceived by this. They teach things what they ought not for money, for filthy lucre's sake. That's what they're interested in. They're deceivers. Verse number 12, one of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God. Yeah, these people, they'll claim, I know God. I know all about God. But in works, they deny him being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. They can't please God. They're, they're disobedient. They're abominable. They deny the truth. They deny God. They profess they know God. They'll tell you, I know God. I know Jesus. But they don't. They're liars. They're deceivers. They're out to subvert houses. They're out to just make money. And since we, we already saw this in this morning, I'm not going to go into it too much. This is my last page of notes. We'll be done a little bit earlier today. Look at Jude chapter number one. This is that parallel passage. I don't remember if we really turn to this, but Jude is right before the book of Revelation. There's only one chapter in the book of Jude. The book of Jude is the, the last book before Revelation. And this is that parallel passage to 2 Peter chapter number 2. And again, the, the false prophet and the reprobate go hand in hand because they're one and the same thing. Jude 1, look at or just Jude, verse number 12. The Bible says, These are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth, Without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. That's just talking about them just being completely damned. Okay, this is again, Jude is talking about false prophets. It says, there are spots in your feasts when they feast with you. They feed themselves without fear. I mean, it doesn't, they know that they're reprobate. They know that they're near God. It doesn't even matter to them. They have no fear. It says that they're clouds without any water. A cloud without water is basically saying it's useless. You know, they're, not, they're full of nothing. They're full of hot air. And then it says, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth. So again, you want to talk about knowing someone by their fruits? If you got a false prophet, their fruit dies. Mm -hmm. It's no good. It's not anything of value. You know, someone who's saved and goes out and, and you know, as a preacher and a prophet goes out, they bear fruit. Hey, that fruit's going to last forever. I mean, it's eternal lasting fruit. If they, if, if they go out and help someone get eternal life by putting their faith in Christ, that lasts forever. But the false prophets, they're not doing that. Their fruit dies. Their fruit is, is nothing. It says without fruit. Then look at this. Twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Mm -hmm. They're not only once dead. You know, it's talking about they're already twice dead. Their soul is dead. Their, their spirit is dead. And when they die, they're going to hell. They're going to the second death. It's already been determined for them. So why it says that they're raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame. Wandering stars. They're just like, they're just like the comets or whatever. They just go through space, just in darkness. It says, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. It's reserved for them. They've already, they've already gone too far. The false mm -hmm. prophet, that's what, you know, that's what the Bible's saying, is that they're, just, they're reserved the blackness of darkness. The, the lake of fire is in outer darkness. That's where, the, where, where hell is going to be relocated to, in the lake of fire. And it's just going to be out of dar outer darkness. It's going to be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. So, I, I hope I was able to make it clear because the, just as, as great of a news it is for, for the believer 
or for anyone really to just know that, hey, salvation is simple. It's only by grace through grace. It's everlasting. It's going to last you forever. As wonderful and, as, and as, as awesome as that is, the exact opposite for the person who just pushes it too far, just rejects God. And here's the, you know, here's the thing. Let's use this, again, as another motivation for us, knowing that just because someone's alive doesn't mean that they haven't already sealed their fate. All the more urgency to preach the gospel and to try to get people saved because you want to get them before they get to that point. Now, I'm not saying, like, I don't know how many people as a percentage actually get to that point and actually are just reprobate, like before they even die. I don't think it's a lot. Um, I honestly don't believe it's a lot of people, but, it's, but it definitely happens. And there's definitely people that the Bible says they can't get saved. They're reprobate. And, and we see some of these um, attributes of people that are, I mean, just clearly will be evidence that, yeah, they've, they've been rejected by God. When God and that's and that's why we have see it's important to understand too because it it makes sense. You think about the people, you think about the John Wayne Gacy's, you think about the Jeffrey Dahmers, you think about the sick, disgusting, perverted people that have walked this earth that have done things that you would never have even dreamed up in a million years. That they just did these. I, mean, I don't even want to repeat them, but like what they've done to little children and 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 hacking them up and the things that they've done, like. Like, you think, what is wrong with that person? They're an animal. There is no explanation for it. They, they have just become a beast. And people will say, well, how can someone like that be saved and go to heaven? They can't. Mm -hmm. They can't. Okay, that is not, they have already been rejected. That's the only reason why they've even gone down that path of just the extreme, disgusting, perverted, unnatural things to do that you would never even dream in a million years. It, it makes perfect sense that, oh, the only reason why that even happened is because God has just completely just rejected them. They're just off on their own, just 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 spinning downward, and downward, and downward, and downward, and downward until they go down into hell. Their final, not even a resting place. Their final place where they're tortured and tormented forever. And um, sometimes that helps people to understand because, you know, especially you know, I've talked to going out solo. I talked to. To parents or people who've, had, who've known like their kids or someone else has been like, like molested and, and have, have had these these horrible things happen to them, and and, and it would be very difficult to think, well, how is that person going to go to heaven? Because that's a really bizarre thing, and well, you kind of understand that. Look, those people are reprobate. I mean, you're not going to see Jeffrey Dahmer in heaven. Like, you're not going to see him. It's not that that he, you know, on his deathbed, like, well, what if he believed on Christ? He couldn't. God, God gave him up. He, he, he did some filthy things, and, and, and all those people, like the, the Adolf Hitlers and stuff like that, I mean, the people have just done unspeakable horrors. They were reprobate. God gave them over. He gave them up. He was done with them. But um, let's use this as a, as a good example to just, just, hey, more urgency. That much more. Just because, I mean, and again, now, I, I, try, I try to be... When we go out so and give people the benefit of the doubt as much as possible, because you don't want to make the mistake of just like assuming so. Oh yeah, they're just reprobate, you know, without I mean, without really knowing, right? So, I mean, if I just see some flaming queer that's just like, I mean, just limp wristed, wearing a tutu or something, like okay, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna chalk him up to being a reprobate. But if I mean, when people talk effeminate, like men that talk effeminate or something like that, you know what? I'm gonna give them the benefit of the doubt. Because I don't know. And I'm just I'm going to try to give them the gospel and try to get them saved. Um, and, and we all ought to do that. Um, this is a truth. This is something that the Bible teaches. There's people who have gone too far. But, hey, let's just go out there and try to get people saved. If, if that's the case, then that's the case. There's nothing you can do to change that. But um, let's just pray that God will lead us to the people that, that, haven't, that, that haven't made that decision in their life. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for the free gift of salvation. You've made it so easy for us, dear God, to be saved. And it's really unfortunate that people reject that gift, especially after hearing about it and knowing how easy it is, dear God, and how much you love them. Um, it's almost unfathomable to think that people would reject that, but, but they do. And um, Lord, we thank you for your long suffering. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you that you're not just real quick to just flip the switch and just say, okay, you're done. 
but that you do give. You give many, many, many chances to your Lord. And I believe everyone here understands that and knows your mercy and knows your love, dear God. But um, help us just to remember this truth. It's not a pleasant thing to think about, but we need to know that these people exist that have wickedness in their heart because they are out to, to deceive and to destroy. Dear God, I believe these people know that they're, that they're reprobate and that they're going to go down and try to corrupt as many people as possible. That's why, they, that's why the, the homos go out and they recruit because they can't reproduce and they go to defile other people, dear Lord. Help us to be aware of this and just to know that these are bad people. We just need to stay away from them. And, and these reprobates have, have eyes that are full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin. Lord, help us to just understand that these people exist so that we can try to just identify them if possible and just, and just avoid them and stay away from them, dear Lord. Um, even for our own safety. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.